Good evening, good afternoon, good morning to all, depending on what your geotag is right now. Welcome to this 11th session of the African Root Edutra Educational Training Series in the context of um, the Willem C. Viss International Commercial Arbitration Moot. I'm very, very excited to have with us here today Stephen Fenizio, who will be sharing his expertise on the fascinating issue of witness examination in arbitration. And although this is not um, an issue that is directly practiced and exercised in the course of the FISMUT, um, of you all know quite well that there are these pesky witness statements that are in the moot problem. Um, Horatio Porter, to mention one. Um, so I hope that you will gain from this session not only just the practical skills of a very controversial issue in international arbitration, um, and very prominent one, but also how to analyze and assess your own evidence and your moot bundle a bit better. Now, before uh, I hand over to Stephen, I think I should introduce him for those that haven't already spied on him already online. That's the, the benefits of modern technology, of course. Um, Stephen is a partner at Wilmer Hale, based in Wilmer Hale's London office, and he specializes in international dispute resolution. He has a very extensive practice and experience in the, the roles of counsel and arbitrator in many cases, um, including domestic cases governed by the laws of jurisdictions in, uh, across Asia, Europe, South America, the United States, and uh, Africa, which is, is most relevant for the people on this call, I'm sure, and also many arbitrations under regional and bilateral treaties. Um, he's also assisted a central European government um, to draft new arbitration legislation and was part of the legal team that won the first freedom of expression case um, in the African Court on People and Human Rights, which some of you may know is um, the case of Issa Loha Konate versus Burkina Faso. So if you want to, to hear a bit more about that process, I encourage you um, to reach out to Stephen in due course like I said, the benefits of modern technology. Okay. Now, in addition to um, his very, very busy practice, Stephen is also a published author. He's also an adjunct professor at the SOAS University of London, alongside um, Emilia Onyema, as you may recall from last month's session. And he's also a founding member and faculty member of multiple arbitration institutions, um, which have as one of their many goals, um, education in the arbitration context. Oh. These include things like the Foundation of International Arbitration Advocacy um, and the African International Legal Awareness in International Treaty and Arbitration Program. I think I, I might have fudged the collection of words a little bit there. But as you can glean very clearly, uh, Stephen is a very busy man. He is, of course, maybe most importantly of all his roles, a very, very dear friend of Africa in the Moot. Um, and there's many more things to say about Stephen's activities and his accolades. But since he's our guest of honor, I will actually give the floor to him and stop talking myself. Before I do so, let me just set a, a couple of uh, some housekeeping rules. Um, as per usual, please stay on Moot during the, the the course of the discussion, but in this case, we ask you to interrupt when you have a question. So please feel free at any moment during the presentation, there will be slides that are displayed. Um, if you have a question, raise your hand or just feel free. We encourage you to do so. It's not rude at all. Um, if it's difficult for you to come off mute, then please write your, your question in the chat box and I will pick it up and we will raise it and take it forward from there. And of course, there will be time for questions at the end as well. Um, if you, you want to wait your moment for that time. So um, without further ado, I hand over to Stephen. Thank you, Aaron. And um, I'm a little bit embarrassed by that, but thank you so much. Uh, let me tell you what I, I, I plan to talk about. I'm going to use slides, but I thought I would start. I'm going to talk about witness examination. And I'm actually going to spend a fair amount of time talking about how we do cross-examination in particular, because I think for, for some of you that may be a, a new topic. I, I'm going to start with some discussion about how evidence itself um, is both taken and introduced in international arbitration, just to set the scene. And I do think that starts to move a bit more towards the moot problem. Um, and I want to I want to sort of emphasize an, uh, a point that I think is important as you think about the moot, which is that uh, storytelling and narrative is really important. In, in advocacy and what you're doing in the mood is advocacy and and part in the way we tell a story and I and I want to stop and say telling a story can sometimes sound pejorative like stories are fiction stories aren't true but um this is what we do it's it, we, we're trying to explain what happened in a way that persuades the arbitral tribunal 
to decide that our client is right and the other side is wrong. So storytelling in, in a positive sense is, is really critical to advocacy. And so and evidence is the foundation on which we, we tell the story and, and the narrative that we use and the way we present it throughout a case is critical. And that means presenting it in all the different places that we talk to the tribunal during the course of an arbitration. And that's going to be uh, in written submissions at various stages. It's going to be potentially in conferences about procedural matters or in conferences dealing with applications. Uh, and eventually it's going to be at a hearing and at that hearing we'll usually have both oral argument, which is what you'll do at the viz um, or in the viz, you're doing the viz in the pre moots but we also have witness examination. So I'll spend most of my time talking about how that's done, but I want to put this all into that context because they're not separate things. They're all part of a, of a case. They're, they're all part of the strategy that you have to put together. And, and the best advocates are usually carrying through with themes um, throughout everything they do in a case. They may not be talking about the same topics all the time, but they are thinking about how, the, how all the pieces fit together. And your advocacy, when you get to that hearing, is often aided if you've introduced the ideas, the themes, the key, the key parts of the story um, earlier and effectively. And I, was, I want to talk a little bit about the differences between written advocacy and oral advocacy. But I'm going to I'm going to switch to slides, and um, I will make them available to Aaron afterwards, and and I'm happy to share them with you all. And I'm also, as Aaron said, happy to have you interrupt at any time to ask questions, make observations. Um, argue with me and Aaron, you too as well. If you if you if you want to add anything, um, let's make this as dynamic as possible, despite the despite the slides. And um, I'm also happy to follow up if you've got questions about these afterwards. But let me see um, if we've got the slides there. Um, someone say yes that you can see the slides. Yes, we can see them. Thank you. So let me, as I say, let me start with the general idea. And the gen and I think the, the key point is to think about what we're doing in international arbitration. We're, we're in, a, in a, an adjudicatory procedure, in a form of litigation. And I think the most difficult part in any um, sort of adjudicatory procedure is to establish disputed facts. But we have particular issues and particular difficulties when we're trying to do that in international arbitration, and and one of the starting one of the starting hurdles is that we are trying to establish the facts, uh, of, and particularly prove our version of the disputed facts in a context where there's usually no statutory law um, that tells us how we're going to do that. And there are you also when you look at arbitration rules, there's usually nothing of any detail in in the arbitration rules that tell us how we're going to do that. And and that means there's almost always either no or very little guidance on the means of, 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 of presenting evidence and, and what evidence is admissible, how we take evidence, how do we obtain evidence, um, particularly from the other side or from third parties, uh, how arbitrators are meant to evaluate and assess the evidence that are that, that's presented to them, and, and questions about burden and standard of, standards of proof. That may, it may seem like, well, that's obvious. There'll be a law that will supply um, the answer to the question of who's got the burden on a point and what and what the standard of proof they've got to establish is. But often that's that's much more difficult to establish. There's there might be arguments about which law applies, and there may be questions about whether any uh, evidentiary laws apply. So we're doing this in this context, which is much less regulated, where there's much less prescriptive in the sense of um, pre prescriptive rules telling us what to do than we would if we were in a litigation. The other the other issue that we're facing is, well, let me I have to remember my own slides. We're, we're operating also in a context in which we don't have, um, let me just jump ahead, where we don't have um, much in the way of a prescriptive framework for the procedure. So we're, we're trying to address both procedure and evidentiary issue, issues in more of a vacuum than we do in international arbitration. The, the two principles that generally will guide decisions about um, what procedures and what and how we're going to handle evidence are these very high level uh, principles that um, parties need to be treated equally and parties need to have a fair opportunity to present their case. And on, on this slide, I've got some of the, the places where you find that those, those principles um, 
espoused. So we see that in the New York Convention, we see that in, in the Trump model law, and we see that in leading arbitration rules. But that tends to be what, what, what the limits are when, when we're trying to fill that vacuum about what, what are the procedures that are going to take place within a case and what are the um, and what principles are we going to apply to those procedures? Otherwise, we're generally in a situation where the parties can agree uh, both to how we're going to handle evidentiary matters and what the procedures will be in the arbitration. And if the parties can't agree, the tribunal will usually be given discretion. And so that, that's what my previous slide was saying, which is that because national laws are generally silent on this and because arbitration rules are generally silent on this, what happens is the parties if, can agree. If they don't agree, we have um, tribunal discretion. And that discretion is bounded only by these principles of equal tre treatment and fair opportunity to present your case. And, and I want to establish this early because when we start talking about what we do at, at hearings and how we handle witnesses, I think it's important to, to think about the, how this fits in to the, the general approach to procedure and, and evidence. And what we're doing in this context, I said earlier, we've got one of the hurdles we have in international arbitration is that we don't have these any prescriptive rules. Um, the, other, the other issue we have is that we're doing this in a multicultural and international context. And, and so we may be doing this in a case where um, one party is coming from one legal system, the other party is coming from another legal system. We can complicate that. They may have they may be coming from multiple systems. Sometimes we're dealing with companies that have uh, people involved in a, in a dispute that are coming from different countries in, with, with, on one side of the case, and they may have hired lawyers from yet another place, or they may have hired lawyers who um, are coming from law firms where um, the, the, the team has, has people from, with different backgrounds, and then they're presenting the case to a tribunal, um, and if it's a three-member tribunal, the three arbitrators may be coming from, from different legal backgrounds. And so we're doing, we're trying to operate in a vacuum with no rules in a multicultural and international context. And I don't want to spend too much time on trying to um, generalize too much about the differences between common law and, and civil law systems. But we often in international cases see parties who are coming from, uh, from, different, um, from different backgrounds where the, the way they think about evidence in particular will be affected by whether they're coming from a common law or civil law background. And I will say everything I'm about to say is a gross generalization. And I will be the first person to tell you that as soon as anyone talks about the, how the common law approach to something is X, I will raise my hand and say, well, you know, I'm an American lawyer. And the way we do things is very different the way than, the, than the way an English lawyer will do things. Um, and so it's very difficult to, to sort of generalize about common law. And it's even harder to generalize about civil law approaches, particularly to things like evidence, but I'm going to make a, a gross generalization right now. And that is to say that um, it's often said, and see I'm creating a little distance for myself, I'm not saying this, it's often said that uh, the, the goal of, of, of an arbitration or any other adjudicatory process from a common law perspective is to find the truth, um, where the goal from a civil law perspective is to, to fairly and efficiently resolve a dispute. And so that difference, and we can argue about whether that's too simple or whether that's, as I said, true across the systems, I think it's a really useful way to think about um, what we're trying to accomplish because depending what, on what your starting point is in terms of what the purpose of the process is, finding the truth versus efficiently and fairly resolving a dispute, when we get to evidentiary issues, and that means issues about how to obtain evidence, including things like document disclosure, but also then how we deal with witnesses when we're getting to a hearing. You may have you may have a very different view about what's appropriate, um, how much time should be spent on certain things, um, depending on what you think the purpose of the process is. And I will come back to that thing because I think it's a it's a useful lens to think about some of the choices that we make when we're when we're dealing with evidence, and particularly when we're dealing um, with with witnesses. Now, we, we often say that in international arbitration, we're striking a balance between civil law and common law approaches. And again, gross, gross generalization that there is a civil law and a common law approach. Um, it's, a, it's also a gross generalization in the sense that most civil lawyers will tell you that what's now common practice in international arbitration is 
not very much like what you would see in a civil law uh, litigation process. Um, at the same time, um, a lot of common lawyers would tell you that what we see in, in an international arbitration context is also not like what you see in common law litigation procedures. But that balance, I think everyone would agree that we're, we've, we're trying to strike in international arbitration, it tilts much more to a common law or even an Anglo-American approach um, than, than it tilts to a civil law approach. Um, and I, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the consequences of that when we start talking about what we see at when we, when we, when we get to hearings in, in international arbitration and, and particularly in, in how we deal with, with witnesses. Um, there are a few things out there that I think if you're going to do international arbitration, it's really useful to, to, um, to know about. And I think um, in particular, one of the most influential and I think uh, therefore important to know about soft law instruments is, um, is the IBA rules on the taking of evidence in international arbitration. And those are meant to give guidance on various evidentiary issues, including the use of witness statements, including document disclosure, including the use of experts, and including how you manage uh, an evidentiary hearing. Um, and so I'm not going to spend time talking about that, but um, the IBA rules are something you should pay attention to if you're interested in international arbitration. Again, they're they're described as a way of, to bridge the, the, the legal and cultural gap between common law and civil law systems, but a lot of civil lawyers will tell you they are much more common law, and we've seen a um, a response through the what's called the Prague Rules, which is a, uh, a set of rules that were published by lawyers mainly coming from Eastern European jurisdictions who wanted to put a stop to this and say, look, let's start from a presumption of a more inquisitorial, non-adversarial approach, and we can set, have a set of rules that assumes more, a more civil law approach to procedures, which you can depart from, rather than one which we see in the IBA rules, which is more of a common law approach that we can depart from depending on whether the parties agree. So those are those are useful things to know about as background. Now, I'm working my way towards um, a hearing and to witnesses, but I want to I want to put that in the context of the sort of submissions and advocacy we're doing throughout a case. And you guys have been involved, you've written, memor you've written the memorials um, as part of the of the mooting process. And, and so you, you know that that's a piece of this. And that's one of the places in which we we do advocacy and in which we introduce evidence. And I want to just briefly again talk about written submissions. So I want to contrast that to what we do when we get to an evidentiary hearing. So as as, as you know and you have done in the in the moot, the general practice in international arbitration is that to, to use memorials and in those memorials is your the, the, the goal is to present a really thorough explanation of both the factual and legal bases for the claim or the defense, and and as as you see in the in the in the moot, the the general practice again is to have those memorials accompanied by written witness statements. And this is important because when we get to the hearing, we're going to be working usually um, with witnesses who have put in written witness statements. And also, in addition to the witness statements, we're putting in the relevant documentary exhibits that support the factual assertions. That we make in the more in the memorials, and then we often also have um, expert reports. Now we can do that differently. We can we can structure it differently so that the the witness statements and the documents and the experts are coming in at a, at a different time than the um, the the argument and the memorials. But the general approach, the most international approach, is to have these comprehensive memorials along the lines that you guys have seen in the in the in the mood. Um, there are different approaches, as I said, and, and some of you are coming from jurisdictions where in litigation you might file, follow more what, of what I would call an English pleadings approach, and we see that sometimes in international arbitration, and one of the beauties of international arbitration is we can always customize, and so there's an infinite number of different ways we can do this, but it's pretty standard to have these comprehensive memorials, and one of the reasons for that, but for better or worse, is it creates, I think, an emphasis in international arbitration on on written advocacy, it also sometimes leads to um, inefficiencies or um, uh, to, um, time and cost issues because it, it, it spurs an approach in which we end up with sometimes really huge um, written submissions. Um, the ones you see in the moot are sort of short um, and, and what we sometimes see in real life are things that are 
two, three, four, six, eight, 2,000 pages long. Uh, and that's a discussion for another time. But there's this emphasis on written advocacy. And that emphasis, I think, in some ways also reflects some of these cultural differences I was talking about earlier. And I want to just talk about that for a minute or two, because I think it's, again, useful to think about when we talk about what we're trying to accomplish at an evidentiary hearing, both in our oral arguments and in, in witness examination. And I think one of the, one of the um, arguments in favor of emphasizing um, written memorials and, and, and sometimes making them so comprehensive is this idea articulated in this quote from, um, from Doak Bishop and um, A.B. Schiffer on the slide is that um, this is the best and fullest opportunity to persuade the arbitrators that the written memorials are where the arbitrators pay attention. And, and, the, and the, the explanations they give, I think, are interesting to think about. They argue that that's true because that in, in many countries, so we're, we're going back to the legal background of the arbitrators, um, there isn't a tradition of oral advocacy. That, you know, the idea being that, in, again, in some, they're, they're thinking about civil law jurisdictions in particular, but there may not be a litigation process in which oral arguments are made, but it's, it's judge-led. Um, and therefore, arbitrators and from those countries may be more persuaded by the written memorials. They've also made this psychological claim, and you can take it for what it is, is that the dominant learning sense of many lawyers who act as arbitrators is reading and not listening, for what it's worth. Um, they also say the reason why the written memorials may be more persuasive is that the written memorials and the written witness statements endure, that they are there's, there's something permanent about them. They're, they're written, the arbitrators can come back to them again and again. It's not ephemeral. You hear it at the hearing, and even if there's a, a transcript that you can reread, the impression will be different from what you've heard, which goes away the, right after you hear it. It makes an impression where they can keep coming back to um, the, written, the written submissions and the written witness statements. So that's, that's the idea that, at least for some arbitrators, the, the memorials are the critical part of of an arbitration proceeding. So now, having said that, I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about the oral part of a case, the the, the, the hearing at where we have um, oral arguments and we have um, examinations of witnesses. And I'm going to I just set the scene, and you guys may know this, but what you have in the moot is a very um, compressed um, uh, hearing because of time time restrictions. But in real life, evidentiary hearings can vary in length and sequence and approach. That means not all cases end with a comprehensive um, comprehensive evidentiary hearing or final hearing in which all the issues are addressed. And, and we have different approaches depending, again, often on the backgrounds of the parties to how long uh, a hearing will be, how many hearings will be. Sometimes we may break up an arbitration to have um, different issues addressed at different hearings. Um, but in terms of length, you guys have in the, in the moot, so, you know, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever it is to do your to do your arguments in in real life, the arguments may um, be that short, but they also may be, you know, all day or multiple days. It depends on the on the participants and it depends on the case. Um, very typically, but not always, the evidentiary hearing will be a mixture of oral arguments. Um, and again, there are different. There's different jargon depending on where you come from. Um, some people find that they're have different. That these words have different meanings, and some people use them um, synonymously. But we have oral arguments or oral statements um, and witness examination, and there may be different sequences. And I'll talk about that. But again, the the idea is we have flexibility, and we can customize um, when we are arranging how to do it in international arbitration, and as a lawyer involved in the, in the process, you should also be thinking about what is the best approach, not just for you, what you're most comfortable with, but you need to be thinking about who the tribunal is and what approach is going to be most effective given the backgrounds um, and, the, and, and sometimes nationality is the way to, to think about backgrounds, but the training and experience of the other side and in particular the training and experience of, of the arbitrators. And then when that's where we're customizing within, within the, the set of options of that that group of people in the particular case um, will think is appropriate. So generally what we see, and I'm generalizing because it'll be different from case to case, 
we, we usually see some form of, of opening statements or, or opening arguments, and that's what you guys are doing. I'm, I'm going to spend just a, a second or two on that. Um, then we will have witness examination, and then we may have um, some form of closing arguments or closing statements, either all within the same hearing or sometimes split off closing arguments, maybe split off for a separate hearing and maybe done both orally and in writing. I'm going to focus on the witnesses in a minute, but let's let's set the scene. Um, the approaches I said to to oral argument, and, I, and this is maybe helpful to you guys because this is what you do in the boot context. But I mean, there are different ways that people do this, and, and really different ways. I had a case recently um, against a Swiss law firm in which they didn't want to have oral argument at all. Their view was, harking back to that quote I gave you earlier, that. Everything was in the written submissions. What was the point of the lawyers repeating things that they already had said in writing? And at best, they wanted to take 10 or 15 minutes to make a couple of what they viewed as key legal points. And I wanted to spend a couple hours to tell the story. Because in particular, I thought um, the arbitrator might not have fully understood in his passive reading of the memorials the, the, the way certain key facts intersected and that by being able to walk through those facts and, ex and explain their relevance, but let him see their relevance, showing him, letting him realize how things connected, we would move our case forward um, much more than just relying on him to have understood that from something that we had submitted many months earlier in writing. And so therefore, given my, my view about what's effective, I, this quote I have on the slide sort of validates my point of view, but is that what we should be doing generally, and this I think is really true when you do the mood, is you're trying to present a coherent theory of your case. And what you're trying to do in your oral argument, and I think in the mood people often fail to do this, is to tell us, to tell, to talk about the facts. And I think in the mood, um, the tendency often is to cut to, to key legal points. But I, I like this idea, and I think it's really important for oral advocacy, that you're trying to tell a coherent, trying to present a coherent theory. And what you're trying to do is having your, your oral argument should have a simple, logical, provable, provable account of the facts. And then you explain that when you view those facts that you've you've laid out in light of the controlling law, the, the tribunal has to conclude that your client should win. And I, I think what's critical about that quote is this idea of provable account of facts. Because what you're doing when you're making an oral argument is not just telling the story, but you're showing. You're showing the key documents. You're, you're giving the, the arbitrators the evidential foundation to understand your case. And so that what well, we see often in, in international arbitration, in which you don't really get to do in the moot, is often then the, the lawyers making arguments will use visual presentations, they'll use PowerPoint. Um, and they're not just using PowerPoint like I am with bullets. That's usually pretty ineffective, but they're blowing up the key documents. They're highlighting the key language. They're creating um, comparisons between key documents. They're, they're doing timelines to try to really show that provable, that simple, logical, provable account of the facts that, if believed, means that they should win the case. Um, so that's, I think, what we're trying to do to me in oral argument. And I think it's something that's critical to think about when you're doing your mood arguments is, is a, a narrative and a story is more persuasive and it, it gives a hook for the people who are listening to understand the case better than sort of a disjointed series of, there's this issue, let me tell you why I'm right about that, there's that issue, and it's, just, it's sort of a laundry list of issues. That's all preliminary. I'm gonna spend the rest of the time talking about, about witness testimony. Um, I guess I should say, any. it looks like the, there might be one question in chat, see here. No. Okay. No, I think it's a connection clarification. So uh, I'm going to jump now into into witness testimony, and I want to start with the question of how do we value witness testimony? Um, it's sometimes described as an important means of evidence. Um, it's sometimes described as the worst means of evidence. And so I'm going to make I'm going to try to make people um, participate. Why, 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 why do we sometimes describe witness testimony as the worst means of evidence? And what are we comparing it to? What do we, what do we think the best evidence is? Anyone want to, want to take a stab at 
at, at why we think witness evidence might be the worst means of evidence and what we're, and what we think the best evidence is? Is everyone going to be shy? So help me at least with what 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 other what other forms of evidence we are we mostly relying on? We're usually relying on some form of document, right? So why do we think documents are better evidence? Or why do some people say documents are better evidence than than witness testimony? No one wants to help me. Oh. Um, hello there. Maybe I should jump in. Please. Thank you. Okay, so with respect to documents, I think documents are fairly, they speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, the terms are fixed, it's not subject to change. But witnesses, of course, may, they may change their views. Their recollection of events may not be as accurate as um, one may wish or hope. And where there are a number of witnesses as well, the, the possibility of inconsistency in their, in their evidence as well may, 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 be, may, be, may be a challenge in terms of assessing and determining the way to place on the, the depositions that they put forward. So perfect, right? I think you've, you've hit most of the, the, the main points, but of course we need to, we need to pull that apart because uh, you know, witnesses may be less reliable that you didn't you did you were kind of polite and didn't say witnesses just may be lying or biased or corrupt right um and one and in many jurisdictions party witnesses can't testify in court or didn't used to be allowed to testify in court we've changed that rule in international arbitration and anybody can be a witness but part of the reason why we we didn't allow or some systems don't allow party representatives to be witnesses is the idea that they're that puts them in a moral conundrum because they're going to have to give testimony that supports their their company um and therefore they're going to be put in a situation where they're either going to have to lie or tilt their evidence or you know face face um consequences um or just um will have such a strong allegiance or loyalty that they're they're going to feel that they have to um potentially be dishonest so that's how we why we criticize um witnesses and why we say documents are better of course Documents aren't perfect, and we have to keep that in mind as well, right? Um, you talked about, I can't remember the phrase you used, but you talked about documents being sort of contemporaneous, and and uh, I can't remember, you used a phrase that was really good, but, uh, you know, documents lie as well. Documents aren't always created for genuine purposes. But before we even get to the fact that documents can be changed, altered, faked, um, there are plenty of instances where people will send a letter or an email um, that's dishonest, and they send it at the time that something happened. So it might be when the contract was being negotiated three years ago, because they're trying to create a record for the future that they can rely on if there's a dispute. I have a case in which one party um, always, as soon as a negotiation ends, will send a letter describing what happened in a way that's pretty inconsistent with what the minutes of the meeting show, but they're trying to create a record. And the other side doesn't really do anything about it um, because they think that the truth will come through um, but you have documents there that purport to record in real time what happened, but they aren't necessarily accurate and they aren't necessarily done um, honestly. Um, the other thing is you talked about inconsistencies between witnesses, but obviously we can have inconsistencies between documents and we also may not have access to all the documents. Um, they're also, and so sometimes, and sometimes we need witnesses to explain what's missing or what, why that, why that inconsist inconsistency between documents, what that means, and what really happened. And often, you know, the other thing is that doc, the 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 piece of the history of the of the dispute or the contract or whatever or the commercial relationship may mostly have been oral, but the documents that do exist can sometimes get um, an outweigh weighted importance because they're still around. And the rest of it happened in a way that can only be recalled by people. Um, and, and if we give much more weight to the documents, we may be distorting the reality of what happened. So we have to be careful about that. But I do think we are getting more and more critical of, of documents. And I, and I have on the slide a site to an ICC commission report that came out, I think, at the end of 2020. Um, or 2019, just, just at a perfect point in time for no one to pay attention to it because the world got complicated. 
but it was it's called uh, it's a report on the accuracy of fact witness memory in international arbitration and it does a scary thing which is to have lawyers talk about science um, which is always it's always risky but the conclusion was i think something that's hard to argue with that science shows that the memory of an honest witness who gives evidence in international arbitration proceedings can easily become distorted and may, be there, may therefore be less re reliable than the witness, counsel, or the tribunal expects. And I think it's important to think about it. What they're saying is the witness themselves may think they're telling the truth, even when they're not, because their memory um, has become distorted. I am not as convinced that the idea that, um, that counsel or the tribunal expects perfect recall um, or has this ex expectation about how reliable uh, witness memory is, is 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 so accurate. But it's important to, to, to flag that you know this is uh, an area of increasing attention, um, and and one of the things we need to take into account when we're thinking about the overall evidence in a case. And you can ask yourself as we walk through this, why do we still put so much weight on witness evidence? And we can talk about that. But um, let's move on to what we do with witnesses. Um, and think about then the, the way we're we're giving to it. And we're going to come back in a way to some of those issues or idea, our ideas I, I started with earlier. What are we trying to accomplish through this process? Now, before we get to that, I, the, I want to talk about the way we generally do things in international arbitration. And again, common practice, which means what we do a lot, not necessarily all the time, doesn't mean it's the right practice, but what we tend to do these days is to adopt this sort of Anglo-American witness examination procedure. And that means we typically will have um, some form of examination of a witness for a party um, and different jargon, depending on different legal backgrounds, but we, we call that direct examination or examination in chief. Um, then we have cross-examination by the lawyers representing the other side. And then we have questions from the tribunal that may come throughout. And I'll talk a little bit about the specifics in a, in a minute, but that we don't have to do it that way. And I, you know, I talked earlier about the Prague rules and this, this sort of civil law approach. And so under the Prague rules, um, there's no presumption that we have cross-examination of witnesses. Um, and under some rules, particularly from civil law jurisdictions, so we've got the Chinese rules, the CTAC rules, um, they, they say expressly that the tribunal can adopt an inquisitorial or adversarial approach to deciding what's appropriate for that case. That said, I, I think practice has really become to build the hearing and the use of witnesses around cross-examination. And we'll talk about that uh, in, in more detail. Um, just quickly, how do we present the witnesses? Well, the IBA rules, which I talked about earlier, sets out an approach, which is the claimant's witnesses go first. And then remember, these witnesses have typically put in a written witness statement, as you see in the moot problem. Um, so the claimant's witnesses will all go first, which means they'll be briefly, usually, usually briefly examined by the claimant's lawyers and then turned over for cross-examination by the other side. When the claimant's witnesses are all done, then we have the respondent's witnesses. That's the approach set out in the IBA rules. But there's lots of different ways to do that. And typically, we we see fact witnesses, fact witnesses first, then expert witnesses. So claimant's fact witnesses, respondent's fact witnesses, claimant's experts, respondent's experts. But we also do it in lots of different ways. Sometimes we'll have all the witnesses about one issue, all the witnesses about another issue. So there's, again, the, the, the freedom to customize the approach and the way we organize this um, for the particular case. Um, so when we have a witness, not only do we have to decide what order the witnesses go in, but then we have a question of what we're doing with them. And as I said, the, 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 com the common approach has become this Anglo-American approach. And we see that in the IBA rules and they, that sets out a process by which we have this direct examination first, cross-examination, redirect examination, and I'll talk a little bit about what that is, um, with the opportunity for the tribunal to ask questions at any time. In reality, what most tribunals will do is reserve questions that they've thought of ahead of the witness's testimony to after the lawyers have done at least the, the direct cross and redirect. And then if they've got pre-planned questions, they'll wait, but they will interrupt throughout any of the examination if a question occurs to them spontaneously or if they don't understand something or if they want to follow up on something. So arbitrators often will interrupt and ask questions, but if they have planned questions ahead of time, and they usually do, they'll ask those questions at the end. Um, I didn't say this earlier, but under most arbitration rules, we don't we don't have an evidentiary code. And I, I meant to I, I meant to say this earlier, but you know, for example, in the UK, 
um, under the English Arbitration Act, it says no evidentiary that the English evidentiary rules don't apply to an arbitration here unless unless someone decides the tribunal or the parties decide to apply them. Um, so we're not operating usually in a, in, a, in a procedure where there's the sort of evidentiary rules that um, we see in litigation. Um, we do see objections to the form of questions, and I'm going to spend a fair amount of time on the form of questions. Um, but because there aren't strict evidentiary rules, what objections can be made to questions are more limited um, because uh, you'd have to, to, to sort of establish why. Usually thinking about those concepts I started with of fairness, equal treatment, um, due process as a way to justify objecting to questions during examination. Um, so we don't see, I mean, if any, I don't know in your home jurisdictions what it's like in in courts, but it, uh, you know, as an American lawyer in an American litigation, um, there are very strict formal rules about the, the way questions are asked and they're therefore are often every question gets an objection uh, because there's all sorts of you know formal bases in which you can challenge the the way the way the question has been posed. That's typically not what we see in international arbitration, and most tribunals would have very little patience with a lawyer who did that. Um, I'll come back to that because there's one exception to that rule um, that I will talk to you about when we talk about how we do how we do examinations. There are other issues with witnesses. I don't I don't I want to get to how we do it. Um, but there are questions about whether we're giving witnesses oaths or affirmations. In some jurisdictions, witnesses have to be sworn, like in a court proceeding. Um, in other jurisdictions, it's illegal to swear witnesses. Um, there's issues about what we call sequestering witnesses. Can witnesses be present um, during the opening arguments? Can they be present when other witnesses are testifying? Um, and there's a whole host of ways to approach that. And then a really interesting topic that we don't have time to get into today is what the lawyers can do to prepare the witnesses to, to be examined, um, to familiarize them with the process, and this idea of coaching witnesses, which is illegal in, or improper in most jurisdictions, but um, where the line is between familiarizing and coaching is wildly different depending on the jurisdiction you come from. And from some jurisdictions, if you haven't practiced and practiced and practiced the potential questions a witness will get with the from the other side, it will be considered malpractice. And in other jurisdictions, if you talk to the witness about um, their testimony and what questions they may get and what their answers will be, you could be breaking the law. And, that, and that's in litigation, but that colors um, views of, of what we do in arbitration. I'll say that with the caveat that most lawyers regardless of where they're from, prepare their witnesses and talk to them about the questions that they may get. But it's in a context where that may be improper um, in certain circumstances in certain jurisdictions. So it's a, it's a complicated issue um, in theory. Um, as I said, in practice, I'm not sure it's as big an issue as it is in theory. Okay, so let's talk about the different forms of examination, unless anyone's got questions up to this point. I want to start with this idea of direct examination, and I call it direct examination because I'm an American lawyer. You may be coming from systems where it's called examination in chief. Um, remember, we're starting with this written witness statement, and you've got those in the moot problem. And so the idea is you're not calling the witness at the hearing to give their testimony for the first time or to go through all their testimony because you've got that written witness statement, which is meant to stand as their evidence in chief. Uh, and, I, and I may have slaughtered that word because it's more of an English, British kind of way of saying things, but it's their evidence. Um, and so because of that, it's become increasingly common in international arbitration for the parties, um, or at least one party, to argue that there should be almost no time for direct examination or that it should be limited to a few minutes. And you'll see procedural orders will say, you know, it will be limited to, a, it will be very brief or limited to a few minutes. And sometimes it'll say, you know, five minutes. Um, and there are lawyers and arbitrators who say it shouldn't happen at all. And so that can be a point of contention when the procedure is being agreed um, as to whether or not there can be direct examination and how long it can go for it and what the scope of it is. And in practice, some of the things that lawyers used to do in terms of introducing the witness and establishing, for example, that the witness statement is the witnesses and whether they want to make any corrections and whether they otherwise stand by it, it is more and more done by the presiding arbitrator, which gives the, the lawyers a smaller role in, the, in, in a lot of those cases. Um, 
what are we trying, if we do have direct examination and if we think we should do it for more than a couple of minutes, what are the things that we're trying to do? Well, generally what we're trying to do is to provide information um, to the to the um, to the tribunal that we think is useful, even if they've read the witness statement. And that with on direct examination, that may include just making sure the tribunal understands who this witness is. You know, they may have seven, 10, 12 witness statements in front of them, remind them who this person is, what their particular relationship to the issues are, you know, what their background is. Maybe they're somebody who's got a, an impressive background that might make the tribunal want to pay more attention to them, but just to introduce the witness and, and make them a, a living human being rather than a name on a piece of paper. Um, confirming their witness statement, as I said, more and more the, the presiding arbitrator steps in to do that. Many times the witness may want to correct things. They may want to say, oops, uh, in paragraph 16, I wrote 4 million and I meant 3 million, um, or I, I wrote 2021 and I meant 2020. Um, they may want to say, more and say, you know, I, I said that I, I would never do that. I meant that I would always do that. So <laughs> the scope of how far they go in correcting may vary, but that, that's one of the things that we do during um, either this introductory questioning by the by the presiding arbitrator or through direct examination. Um, more often, and when parties want to have more than a couple of minutes to do direct examination, but they what they want to be able to do might be to address new issues that have come up since the written witness statement was submitted in the case. And if you can think about it, if we do this stuff sequentially, it's often the case that the witness statement may have been put in in, in January, and then the other side put in rebuttal witness statements in March, and then there was some more submissions, and, and, and maybe there was more documents put in, and the witness might have things to say about all that stuff that came after they put their witness statement in. So what we may use there um, direct examination for is it is at least to let them um, address the, these new these new issues or these new facts that have been raised since their witness statement went in. And then more generally, you might just want the witness to 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 answer questions that will tell you well, that will support the case. You may want them to repeat the things or the key things or or hit the most important points in their witness statement because you may think that hearing this from a living breathing person might be more persuasive than it being written in just in a, a, a flat, dry witness statement that was submitted many months before and maybe written, uh, read many months before by the tribunal. So you may think having the witness summarize or, or, or refer to or explain some of the key issues is one way to get the arbitrators when they're now sitting in a room dealing with all these issues to understand your case better. And it may also help you when you're going to then cross-examine the other side's witnesses to have had your witnesses had the chance to repeat the most important things in your case. And that's where there's a, a conflict between sometimes the lawyers and the arbitrators, because the arbitrators just think this is all boring and re repetitive. And they'll often say, I don't want to hear that because I've read it. And sometimes the lawyers have to push back, but it's also case dependent, right? You may think in this case, it doesn't matter, but in another case, that witness is so compelling or she can explain things so much more persuasively orally than, than the words used in the witness statement. That's really important for me to be able to ask some questions where she gets the opportunity to do that. And that's and that's, so that's a procedural argument um, that you may have to, to fight when, when the particular procedure is being established for, for a hearing. Um, the last reason why we like direct examination often, even when we don't have anything substantive or we don't have the chance to ask the questions that are going to deal with letting the witness address some of the key issues in the case, is it still, there's a human and psychological aspect of this. It, it, it's scary to testify in an international arbitration. It's a legal proceeding. Um, in bigger cases, there may be 50 people in the room staring at you. There may be you know, millions or even billions of dollars at stake. Um, it may not be happening in a courtroom, but it's a still pretty. It's a formal, um, a formal legal proceeding, and you may have just been sworn to tell the truth, subject to to, perj to perjury. Um, um, and therefore, what you may want to do during direct is simply to give your witness the chance to have a few questions that warms them up, gets them a little comfortable and familiar in the in in the setting, and questions asked by a you know, easier questions, ideally asked by a friendly face, a familiar face, before they're thrown to the 
to the, the wolves who are going to cross-examine them. So that's another reason why um, lawyers sometimes still want to have um, direct examination, even, even if the tribunal says we don't, we don't really want to hear this because we've read the witness statements. So how do we do how do we do direct examination? Well, this is where we start to get formal a bit, even though we don't have evidentiary rules. Um, first of all, what we need to be doing is we need to be asking short, simple, and easy to understand questions. And you might think, well, look, it's a lawyer who worked with the witness to prepare their witness statement. There isn't any room for misunderstanding. But I, I will tell you that nervous witnesses can freeze. And if you ask complicated questions, among other things, you may have a witness who you, you know very well who stares at you <laughs> looking like a, a lost sheep. Um, so you need to ask questions that are short, simple, and easy to understand. But they're also, the reason they have to be short, simple, and easy to understand is because you're asking the question for the witness, but you're also asking the question for the arbitrators who need to be following along. And we're usually, and pretty much always in an international case, making a written transcript of this. And so you need the transcript to be clear. And then the moment you start asking complicated questions, um, you're, you're adding potential confusion. Now, the formal approach is that you're generally, and I, I want to use my words carefully here, the general practice is not to allow the lawyers to ask leading questions on direct examination. And you may ask, where is that rule? We all know this rule. Uh, or at least those who do litigation in common law jurisdictions, we all know the rule that you're not allowed to ask um, leading questions on direct examination. But if we don't have evidentiary rules in arbitration, where does the rule come from? And the, and the answer is, there's a little bit of a hint that you shouldn't do this in the IBA rules, but the IBA rules are just soft law. Where that rule really comes from is it's hardwired into the brains of, of a lot of arbitrators. But there's also... It, there's also a pragmatic reason. If you're asking leading questions, the, you're, you're creating the impression that you have to take the witness to the answer. And I'll explain what a leading question is in a minute. But that it reduces the credibility of the witness. If the lawyer has asked a leading question and the witness just says yes or no, what's the value? And, and it actually raises the question, without that leading question, what would the witness have said? So regardless of the fact that there isn't necessarily a rule that says you can't do this. You you run up against the the deeply ingrained culture that you're not supposed to ask leading questions during direct examination, and you um, and you also run into the fact that you're undermining the value of the examination if you're if you as a lawyer are putting the words into the witness's mouth. So I'll come back to leading questions more on cross because on cross that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to do. We're trying to only use leading questions or mainly use leading questions. So what's the difference in a leading or closed question versus an open question? An open question, and these are the questions we have to ask on direct examination, is how, what, when, where, why, or a question that says, can you describe what happened? Can you explain what happened? Um, and this will become a little bit clearer when we get to when we get to cross-examination. So I will come back to it. But um, that's how we ask open questions. We don't introduce the answer to the question in the question. And, if, and then we don't ask questions that can only be answered yes or no. You can't answer a question that begins with how, what, when, where, why, describe or explain with yes or no. And if you can answer the question with yes or no, it's, you know, it's a shorthand way to say you've asked a leading question. So that's direct. I want to spend the rest of the time really focused on cross. I'll briefly talk about re-examination or redirect examination at the end, but I'm going to talk about cross. And I'm going to come back to this idea of, of legal background um, affecting how arbitrators view the value of witnesses and particularly the value, value of cross-examination because cross-examination is what we spend most of our time on um, in, in evidentiary hearings. So let's start again, and all of this is gross generalization, but um, the Anglo-American view is that, and this is a quote from Whit Whitmore on evidence, but you find this lots of other places, that cross-examination is beyond doubt the greatest legal engine ever invented for the discovery of truth. And if any of you watch you know, legal dramas, TV shows, films, um, we're all familiar with that cross-examination where the lawyer gets um, the witness to confess that he murdered his wife um, because the because the cross examination has been so well crafted and is so brilliant, um, and that's this idea. And again, 
if you come from a system that says we want to discover the truth, that's the purpose of an ad adversarial procedure, and cross-examination is the greatest legal engine ever invented to discover the truth, you're going to put a lot of weight and you're going to put a lot of focus during the evidentiary hearing on cross-examination. Um, here's a, a counter view from a Swiss lawyer saying, um, while English and American lawyers, arbitrators might rely on what the witnesses say, um, European arbitrators, civil arbitrators are more inclined to rely on contemporaneous documents and the circumstances surrounding the establishment of those documents. So back to the question that Samuel, I think, answered earlier about what's more valuable and the idea being that civil lawyers will say, you know, witnesses, great, they're unreliable and this may all be entertaining, but what really matters is what the, what the documents, the contemporaneous documents say, say. So that's sort of this difference and you need to be thinking about that when you are planning your cross-examination because the last quote is gonna pull this together and say it doesn't matter, those, different, those differences don't matter so much because in international arbitration, that common law approach to rely on cross-examination is now really well established. And um, the quote from Bouchard Gayard, if you read it, what it says is that even arbitrators and counsel who, in an, when the arbitration has, are, has only arbitrators and counsel from civil law jurisdictions, we're now using um, cross-examination. And that's a quote from 20, nearly 25 years ago. So this has become common practice. The practice in international arbitration, even when all the lawyers are coming from, um, as they use the phrase, the civil law family, is to rely on, on cross-examination as a key part of, of the hearing. Now, that doesn't mean that civil lawyers, common lawyers will respond to um, cross-examination and, and the approach you take in cross-examination the same way. And, and so you see here are some observations from very experienced arbitrators, uh, Gary Bourne saying, um, you know, from common law jurisdictions, it's often not just that we have cross-examination, but we do it very aggressively. That's the style. And that civil lawyers who aren't um, as accustomed to that may find um, a cross-examination, which is focused on attacking the credibility of witnesses, not just um, inappropriate, but also, un or not just unhelpful, but inappropriate. So they may react badly, even though they, they accept cross-examination as the as 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 an integral part of the process. If you do it aggressively, you may be losing them and turning them off. And then uh, this other quote, it goes further. It says, for a civil lawyer, this idea is of cross-examination is sort of vaguely distasteful, but the idea of a witness being required to agree or disagree, and remember, we're going to talk about how we do this, but these are we're asking leading or closed questions. So we're, we're, when we're asking questions in cross examination, we're asking yes no questions. We're asking the witness to agree or disagree with what the lawyer says, is um, positively repugnant to a civil lawyer. So you have to bear that in mind, even if even if if cross examination has become the, the prevalent way of doing it in international arbitration. So um, what we're trying to do, and I'm going to walk through this a little bit more slowly, is, and I'll talk, I'll come back to how we do close or leading questions in a few minutes. But what we're trying to do, we're, we're trying to come up with, with objectives when we plan to do a cross examination. And and one of one thing we may be trying to do is to advance your own case, right? You're trying to get the witness, even though the witness is the other side's witness, to give you favorable testimony that helps your case. And you may be doing that in ways that are pretty um, unaggressive. And I think I'm mean, going to keep coming back to this idea that the way we approach cross-examination, particularly in a commercial case where there may not be someone who murdered their wife, um, there may not be someone who's lying, there may just be people who have honest disagreements about what happened, um, what you're trying to accomplish in cross-examination may be more subtle. And so it may be that what you're just trying to do is to get the witness to provide a more complete or what you view as more accurate version of the events and the one that they've put into their witness statement, right? So you're trying to say, you've said X and Y, but on cross-examination, I'm going to get you to admit there was also, you know, Z and A. Um, and it may be that you're trying to get them just to concede that there were additional facts that they didn't address or that some facts that they downplay or don't talk about are um, are important. Um, so that's may all that may be all you can hope to accomplish and all you want to accomplish on a cross-examination. Um, in a commercial case. Um, you may also, that's to help find ways to help your own case, but you also may be thinking, how do I use 
their own witnesses to undermine the strength or believability of the other side's case. And, and you may be trying to do different things depending on the facts and depending on the witness. You may just be trying to show that the witness's testimony is limited and you might want to put them in a box to say, you know, they've given helpful testimony to the other side, but I want to show that that testimony is, is limited and more limited than it may have come across in, in, the, um, in the written witness statement, maybe by showing that all the things that the witness wasn't involved in, all the meetings that she wasn't at, all the, all the documents she didn't see, to say, I'm not saying that what she tells you is wrong, but I'm telling you she, had, she doesn't know a lot of important, important things, and therefore you should, the value of her testimony is, is not as, as, as um, high as you might have thought it was. Um, you may want to go further and, and show that the witness is unreliable um, and not telling the truth or is biased or forgetful or, uh, you know, is, is leaving key facts out. And you may want to discredit the witness when they're talking about a certain event or a certain issue. Not that the witness generally is a liar, but when they get to this topic, they're not trustworthy. Um, but you may, depending on the witness and the case and the facts, you may want to go further and try to show that the witness is entirely unreliable. Um, you need you need um, usually a, a, a lot to be able to do that, but that may be what you're trying to accomplish. And in, in some cases, that is um, what you need to do or what you're trying to do. So these are the objectives. And I'm going to talk about how you put those objectives into practice in a few minutes. Um, but I want to talk more generally about what we're trying to accomplish to sort of focus the conversation. And I, I love this quote on the top of this slide because I think it's really important. Um, the force of a good cross-examination is found in the substance of the questions asked. Um, they should be carefully thought out and meticulous, meticulously phrased to be very pointed like a sharpened scalpel, not a blunt instrument. Now, the stuff about scalpels, you know, that all sounds sexy, but I think the key thing to focus on here is what makes a good cross-examination is the substance of the questions. And part of the reason for that, that is because you can't control the answers when you're asking a cross-examination. So part of what you're doing is you're arguing your case back to the tribunal through your questions. And so you've got to ask your questions in a way that you're, you're, you're advancing your case regardless of what the witness says. And that also means that you have to be really tight and thoughtful in the, in the words you use because you are... Um, a going to tell your case better if you're if, if you if you've got that sharp sharp and scalpel, but B more likely to get good testimony from the other side's witnesses and to control them and to prevent them from giving bad testimony if you've got very sharp questions. And then this other this other quote I also think is is interesting to think about. The main purpose of cross examination is to weaken the persuasiveness of the witness's testimony. Um, and The idea is that the witness's testimony is one of the other side's puzzle pieces. So both sides have a puzzle. The testimony from each witness is a piece of that puzzle. And what you're trying to do during your cross-examination is to show that the, the other side's puzzle pieces don't fit as nicely together as they argue in their, in their case. So you're trying to, to say that doesn't fit quite as neatly together. And you're, sure you're trying to, to impeach the either the credibility of the testimony or change its shape and size or tell the tribunal you should throw it on the floor and take and, and leave a hole there because the witness is not reliable at all. So those are the high level things we're trying to accomplish um, when we do a cross-examination. So how do we do this in practice and how, do we, and how can we do it more pragmatically? Well, you know, one of the things we try to do is we try to lock in areas of agreement and get concessions that are helpful to your case. These are the sort of the low hanging fruit that we try to accomplish, um, even where we don't think that the witness is easy to ask, easy to discredit, and we may, may be impossible to discredit. So we still need to cross examine them, and we can come back to my, why I think we may still need to cross examine a witness. But we, what do we do? We try to lock in areas of agreement, we try to get some concessions that are helpful. We use the witness to educate the tribunal about key facts and helpful documents. And so what we're doing is we're not caring so much about the answers. We're using our questions to remind the tribunal of key facts and, and key, key parts of documents or key documents. Um, and, that, and we use that then and we go further to try to, as I said, show the limits 
of the of the witness testimony and gaps in the, in the other side's evidence, what they don't have. Um, and and then we go further. We try to highlight inconsistencies between the testimony, the written testimony, and and documents. So we try to show the witness said this, but the memo that was shared at the time or the meeting minutes say that. Um, or we try to we try to show that the witness says this, but other witnesses say something different and something inconsistent. So we're trying to start to undermine the believability and reliability and the, the shape of that puzzle piece. Um, and then obviously, if we can, we want to go further and, and use the questions to point out where the witness's testimony is implausible or unreasonable. And if we can go further, we want to undercut the witness's credibility at all. But we're trying to build from the, the, the foundation, just try to get some agreements and some concessions and educate the tribunal to building up to the idea of trying to go all the way to um, undercut the credibility of the witness. So how do we do that? Well, we start usually using their written witness statements. Um, and we're and, and it, we're trying to draw the tribunal's attention to the witness's own words. And therefore, again, we, we may use their, their witness statement to, to get them to concede things or to identify places in their, in their witness statement where they acknowledge that they don't know something or they only know something um, without 100% confidence. Um, and then we're looking for inconsistencies and, um, and trying to show where in the witness statement where the witness may have gone beyond what they really know. Um, and then as we're planning for this, what we're thinking about is we're looking for what the witness statement doesn't say. And I think this is critical to figuring out how to plan across examination. We're often thinking about not did, what did the witness say, but what did the witness not talk about that we know is important or that it's strange that she didn't address. And then we're thinking about, do we want to go after those areas? Not only do we want to point it out, but we want to ask questions um, to get to go after the things that the witness statement doesn't cover. So we're using the witness statements and we're also using the documents in the record. Um, and so to plan for that, what are we doing? We're looking at all the documents that the witnesses, that witness would have seen at the time. And we're thinking about, is there something that they saw at the time that isn't mentioned or that's helpful? And do we want to ask them about that in, in, in cross? Um, as I said earlier, we're also using the questions to draw the tribunal's attention to key documents. Um, but we also, we have to be careful. And I think lawyers sometimes make the mistake of focusing only on the documents and the parts of the documents that the other side has focused on. And you've got to look at the document, documentary record to think about other parts. And if the other side has made a really big deal about, about this paragraph on page two of a letter, you might want to take the, make sure the tribunal goes to a paragraph on page five that has some interesting um, um, facts in it or statements in it. Um, and so you're using the witnesses to, 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 um, to, to um, show gaps in the overall record and not just challenge the witness directly. Um, what else are you doing? Um, let me skip ahead a couple of slides right, just for, for time. You, you wanna challenge the foundation of the witness's knowledge. So you might be, you might, particularly with a, with a certain kind of witness. So if you think this witness is, is going beyond what they really know, or they, 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 they are, they're either overstating or they are talking about things that they really don't, don't know about, you might focus questions on what the basis is for their claim to remember something or to, to know about something. Um, and often we're talking about in, in commercial cases, um, events that have happened a number of years ago. So you may wanna understand how they refresh their recollection going back to some of those issues we talked about earlier about witness memory and also about preparation of, of witnesses. And if there aren't any documents that sort of show what the witness is saying, <laughs> you may want to ask, you know, ask questions designed to suggest you can't, you couldn't possibly remember this as, as well as you claim to now, um, this many years later. And, and you may, may also want to get out, did you, were you actually there? Were you actually part of that conversation? Um, do you know that, or and is that something that's really credible that you would have known that at the time, given your role? Were you too senior to have been involved in that meeting? Were you too junior? Um, you want to explore those sorts of things to undermine their, the foundation of their knowledge. And again, we we want to try to find inconsistencies. Um, I, will, I won't repeat all of this, but we're trying to find inconsistencies. Inconsistencies we're trying to find in implausible statements. And we're also looking for places where the witness is speculated. I have a case right now that I've got a filing in in the next couple of days where the other side's witnesses kind of bizarrely say, we don't know whether something happened, but it's possible that it happened. Now, obviously that's going to be, um, you know, when we get to, to cross-examining them, the idea of saying, I don't know that it happened, but it's possible it happened is, um, is something that you'll, you'll want to highlight and, 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 
push on in a cross examination. And the guy, and the goal is to have the witness either acknowledge that the testimony is overstated or to stick by it to you know to insist on something they couldn't possibly know as well as they say they do that is true and that may undermine um, their credibility. So you're winning either way if you can show a witness who is is trying to stick by something that is implausible, unreasonable, or they couldn't possibly know. And then I guess the last thing, and then I'm gonna talk for the rest of the time about some specifics about how we do this, is that when we're doing cross-examination, we need to be careful not to give the witness an opportunity to improve the other party's case. And we see this a lot where lawyers ask questions that actually give the witness a chance to, to support her case, or the case of the party that's put her forward. Um, and so we have to make careful choices when we're planning a cross-examination to avoid questions or topics that will give the witness an opportunity to reinforce the other side's case, which is why we have to tightly frame and have that scalpel sharp question. Um, and if you if you don't know what the witness is going to say, you, before you ask a question, you have to think, no matter what she says, will the answer hurt me or will the answer be harmless? And then, of course, and this is the hardest part of a cross-examination, it's going to happen anyway. And you have to have plans to figure out what to do if the witness does say something that is unexpected or is really not helpful to your case, but helps the other side's case. And then you have to be adjusting as you go along. You're reacting to this particular witness, what he or she is like, whether they're being argumentative, whether they're being cooperative, whether they're making speeches, whether they're being very close-lipped. You have to be thinking about how you're adjusting your questions, and and that may have, you know, that may um, guide you a bit on on whether a certain question might give them the chance to help um, improve their case. Because if the witness is you know just grunted at you for most of the questions, maybe you can assume that they're not suddenly going to make a, a really harmful speech. Um, but you also, I mean, sometimes lawyers make the mistake of thinking, "Aha, I can really get the witness to show the witness is wrong about something." that's really irrelevant minor, and they do it anyway, but in the, and what they end up doing is ignoring the fact that they've drawn the attention of everybody in the room to a document, for example, that has really bad stuff for their own case. Yeah, they've gotten the witness to admit a small thing, but they've reminded everybody of the big bad thing. So you have to be really careful when you're doing that. Um, I'm gonna skip experts. I wanna, I wanna talk now about how we do this. Um, what we try to do and, and and how we control witnesses. Maybe let me stop and talk about control because you've got two human beings in a room and you've got one empowered to ask questions and the other told to answer those questions, um, but who isn't really happy with having to do that. Um, and witnesses often will want to um, not answer the questions. They may want to argue with the lawyer who's asking the questions. They may want to add and say more than the lawyer wants them to say. So you have this, this notion of control. And if you're doing the cross-examination, the idea is how do you keep the witness doing what you want the witness to do, which is to answer your carefully thought out questions and not ignoring them, making speeches, arguing with you. And the way you do that, the way you control the witness is to be clear, is to, again, as with direct examination, ask short, simple questions. And the, the, the more lengthy and complicated the question becomes, the more room there is for the witness to say a lot more because you've given them a complicated um, question or questions. Um, you want to use simple language for the same reasons as indirect. You want to use facts. You don't want to argue with the witness. You don't want your question to be argumentative. You want to ask them about facts. And you want to only ask about one fact for each question. This is one of the key things in witness examination is you don't ask six things at once. You have to build up. You have to establish this fact and then move to that fact and move to that fact. And that's how you control a witness. And that's how you actually um, communicate your story through questions to the tribunal. So um, how do we do this really in practice? So how do you control a witness? Well, one of the ways you prevent a witness from steering the answers to, to their, the testimony they want to give and their more, form, their, their, their more favorable um, testimony is you have to form the questions in a way that leads the, the testimony to the topics you want to, to discuss. So you use phrases like, you would agree, wouldn't you, that, and then you have your one simple fact, right? And that way you, you're not giving the witness any scope because you're using that form of leading question that is constructed in a way that, that doesn't give them room to talk about other things. Um, and so what we're trying to do is we're trying to ask, answer questions as much as, ask questions as much as possible that um, 
only can be answered yes or no. So Mr. X, you served on the finance committee from 2010 until 2015, correct? Um, there's only one answer to that. Um, you generally attended the meetings of that committee, correct? And you, that phrase generally attended, you've taken that from his witness statement. So you're so if he says, well, what do you mean by generally? You're going to take them and you've got this scripted out. You've got notes that let you, um, as soon as the witness says something odd or doesn't agree with you, to take them to the paragraph in, in, in his witness statement where he said that. Um, but you didn't attend all the committee meetings, did you? Um, and then now you're you're fishing a little bit, but you're fishing because he used the word generally. And if he says, mm, I, I, I did I did attend all of them. And you say, well, why did you use the word generally attended? That suggests that you didn't go to all of them. Do you really remember, um, et cetera. But you're doing this through a series of simple one fact questions in this closed form. And what you're also doing, and this is really important, is you're showing the witness that you know their witness statement inside and out. And that's going to start to make them think, I've got to be really attentive and careful about what I say. And maybe it's easier to say yes or no than make a speech because this person asking the questions really knows what I've said. And therefore, I don't have room to sort of wiggle around. So um, again, we, we want to avoid compounding questions. We want to avoid asking two questions at once. And this comes back to what I said earlier, that we don't have as much scope to object to questions in international arbitration, but where you get um, where you get objections are on direct when you're leading and on cross when you start to ask multiple questions together. And it's often tactical. The lawyer wants to object not because he cares or she cares that the question has, has multiple questions built into it, but because they want to interrupt the flow of the cross-examiner and because they also want to make the cross-examiner look a little less competent than the cross-examiner wants to look to keep control of the witness. And, and remember, on cross-examination, your minimum goal is to have the tribunal listening to your questions because you're advancing your case theory. So if the other side makes you look argumentative, makes you look sloppy, you're losing the ability to have that minimum benefit of, of using the questions to show your case. So here's an example of, of breaking questions up. Mr. X, you're currently vice president of finance and treasury for, for Y Finance Company, correct? You also served on the finance committee from 2010 and until 2015, correct? That's two questions with one fact each. And if we did it the way we might normally do it in conversation, Mr. X, you served on the finance committee for quite a long time after 2010 and also changed position at Y Finance in your career, correct? They could say yes, but you've given them two questions, which makes it natural and, and frankly, the tribunal less bothered if they then make a speech about their, in this case, it's just their career history, but you're asking, you're inviting them to talk much longer than, than you are if you ask those two simple fact-based questions. And if you do it, those, those simple fact-based questions, closed questions, you, 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 the witness is more naturally going to start to get into a, potentially into a rhythm where they're, you know, they're giving you, and you can control the pace then, yes, yes, no, yes, yes, no, and, and they're not stopping to interrupt you, they're not stopping to argue with you, and they're not stopping to make, to make speeches. Um, how do we set up the questions? Well, depends on the case, depends on the witness statement, but we can sometimes set them up chronologically. Um, we might want to do it by topics. I want to talk about the meeting in December 2019, where the, the supply agreement was agreed. We may want to talk about, uh, mix it up a bit um, uh, of both. Um, you also, but as you're asking questions, you need to be thinking always, what is the point of my question? What am I, try what am I trying to accomplish? Why am I asking that question now? And you need to do that for two reasons. One is, you might get, if the question comes out of the blue and isn't obvious, the tribunal may ask you, where you're going, and you, you kind of need to be able to answer. Um, but also, you may have limited time, and you and if you don't know what you're, you're, the questions are, where the questions are going, you're wasting you're wasting the time, and you're not in control if you're just asking random questions. So you you really need to have a plan. And and so I, before I go on with um, some of the other parts of how we ask questions, how do we do this? Well, we this, every lawyer does it a little bit differently, but most lawyers will script out. Uh, a cross-examination, and some of them will write precisely the questions because they want to make sure they've got that scalpel sharp um, closed question. Um, others might leave it to, to be spontaneous about the exact framing of the question, but they usually will have 
as I said, some sort of notes, some sort of um, list of things to refer to if the witness disagrees or says something unexpected, or at least to show why, uh, what the basis for having asked that question is if the tribunal or the witness or the other side's lawyers uh, challenge it. What a lot of lawyers also do is to have lines of cross-examination where they've identified their objective. So they, they, here's a series of 10, 15, 20 questions I'm going to ask about this. And my goal is to get this particular thing out. So I'm going to show some inconsistencies. Um, if I can go further, I'm going to show that she's left out a critical fact. If I'm going to go further, I'm, I'm going to be able to suggest that she is making this all up. But they, they've got a, a purpose in mind for each line of cross-examination that they've, they've scripted. And so this idea of why am I asking this is, is should be easier because everything should have been thought through ahead of time. And you also, as part of this, as part of clarity, what you also can do is you can make, you can make introductory or headline um, um, or roadmaps or, or, or have transitions between different lines of questions. The way you're encouraged to do this during your oral, oral argument at the moot to give roadmaps, you can say to the witness and again to the, the important audience, the tribunal, now I'd like to move on to that meeting on 14 January to help everyone sort of understand. And you may want to do that, but you may not always want to do that because occasionally you might not want to let the witness know where you're going. So you have to think about that. But you do you you are doing this in front of an audience, and if you're just asking a long series of questions that don't seem to have a connection, you might be you may be losing your audience. So you need to think about that. So I mean, so far that should sound. Um, really is easy. Why Why is it hard? Well, it's hard because you're doing multiple things at once. You're, listen, you're listening to the answer and you have to really listen to the answer. You have to, you have to be thinking, did the witness give the answer that I wanted them to give that I, and that I expected them to give? If they did, was the answer clear? I may have known what they meant, but when I read this back on the transcript or did the tribunal understand what was meant by the answer, yes, yeah, so we have to be listening to the whole answer. And if the witness doesn't say yes or no, but answered in a paragraph or in three paragraphs of uh, on the transcript of run on argument, you have to listen to everything in part because something may have been dropped in there that you need to go after or introduces new opportunities for you. And while you're doing that, you have to be thinking about your next question and, and that scalpel sharp next question. So you're thinking about questions while you're also processing the answer. And ideally, you're also watching the witness to try to figure out whether the witness is sending you any signals from the way she's reacting to the question. You're trying to keep an eye on, on the tribunal to see whether they're sleeping or paying attention, and if it was an important answer, whether they got it. So you're doing lots of things at once. And when you first start doing cross-examinations, it can feel overwhelming. Um, and so the, and the more you do it, um, you the more the, it just happens quicker, but it's that's what's so difficult, difficult about cross-examination because the witnesses will very often not say what you expect to say, and, and therefore you have to always be planning for them to say something that's unexpected. Um, another thing you have to be doing, and it's just human nature, is you have to not be arguing with the witness, and, and one of the things that can happen, particularly as passions may come into this, is that the, the, the lawyer and the witness start talking over each other. Well, you know, that might be satisfying on a psychological level. It's not helpful to the tribunal. It's not helpful for the transcript. So you have to be avoiding interruptions. And so some of the things you might do in a, in a conversation in a non-formal setting, um, you may not be able, you have to stop yourself from doing in, in a, in a cross-examination. Um, some general rules, it will often be said that you shouldn't ask a question that you don't know the answer to. Um, in international arbitration, um, unlike some court systems, you kind of sometimes have to ask questions you don't know the answer to because you may have a two-page witness statement and you have to ask about things that you just don't know what the witness is going to say. So you have to be thinking, if I'm going to ask a question that I don't know what the answer is going to be, do I have a plan to make sure it can't hurt me? Um, another one of the hardest parts of cross-examination is knowing when to stop asking questions. Um, and often a witness will give you something really helpful. And you kind of want to ask the next question to really nail it down, but you're afraid that if you ask the next question, the witness will figure out a way to, to fix what they just gave you or, or make it less clear. 
And it's just one of the most difficult things to do. You, you can make mistakes by not asking them the next question and you don't get the perfect answer that you would have gotten had you asked it, but you can also um, ask one question too many. And again, that comes from judging the situation, judging how the witness has been and knowing your case really well. Um, and so I'm gonna skip past a couple of these things. I wanna talk about two last things and I'm gonna stop for us to, to um, to, to, add, to have any questions, if you've got questions. One is, um, we talk about impeaching witnesses. Um, and, and what does that mean? Impeaching witnesses is when we challenge a witness, a witness with something that's contradictory. And this is, if we're really gonna show a witness is not telling the truth or, or is being incomplete or is saying things that are, that are, um, that, that are unreasonable, we, we need to, to contradict them with something that shows the opposite. And that's what, we, that, that's what we mean when we talk about impeaching a witness. So what we're doing, we're usually doing that by showing an inconsistency between what the witness says in their witness statement and what they say, and what the documentary evidence or other evidence in the case shows. And so one way we do that is to, 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 to lay the foundation for the, the point we want to impeach. So we get the witness to that issue and we, we get the witness to, to confirm what they've said usually something in their witness st statement or something they said earlier. So we're getting them to confirm, yes, I was at that meeting and we agreed at the meeting that, I, that we were going to pay 20,000 pounds a month for, for those goods. Um, and then the second step is to show the witness something that's completely contra contradictory. Um, but we don't do it immediately. You don't say, you say in your witness statement that there was, uh, that you were at that meeting and the, there was an agreement to pay that price. Here's this document that says something else. To really be effective, what you try to do is, is build up to that. So you'll, you'll you'll have that contradictory piece of evidence, but you will um, you try to get the witness to validate it first. So you might put, if it's minutes minutes of the meeting, you might put the minutes in front of the witness and, and, and get them to confirm that those are the minutes of the main meeting. Um, they, they're the ones who drafted them. That's their signature at the bottom. And then you get them, get them to the conflicting content. So you, what you've done is both have a much clearer transcript, but you give the, the tribunal also time to really see the contradiction rather than by jumping straight to it. Um, I, and there's examples in the slides, but I think it's it's pretty obvious. Um, another way to impeach a witness is to show that there just is no basis for what for what they're saying. That they, for example, they don't have any personal knowledge or there's not, no other foundation in the record for that testimony. Um, and so one way we might do that is to, 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 to take the witness, for example, to their witness statement. Mr. X, in your witness statement, you state in paragraph 11 that Z International and its former management appoint, appointees in February 2018 took a number of actions that were designed to obstruct its operations, correct? Um, can you please show me where the minutes of 13 February refer to these alleged actions? Um, and so the idea is to say, look, you said something really bad happened, but wouldn't it be odd, wouldn't that have been discussed at the, uh, the the board meeting um, that happened at the same time. If, if it was really such a big deal, wouldn't that have been in the record at the time? So you're trying to show what they're saying now is implausible because if it had been as big a deal uh, back in when it happened, it would have been recorded in documents. And then this is where sometimes you have to make the judgment call about how far you go. You might you may just show them, ask them a question, where is that in the minutes? And let the tribunal draw their conclusion. Well, that's odd that that's something that he says is so important isn't in the minutes, or you may want to go further and ask the next question. You'd expect, wouldn't you, that something that you say exposed the companies to such severe risks would have been discussed in the finance committee meeting at the time, right? So you're making it clear to the tribunal the significance of that gap and the, the way it contradicts the witness's testimony. So those are sort of what we try to do in cross-examination, but I want to end on, on a couple of points I think are really important. Um, and I've stolen this phrase from Martin Hunter, um, I believe. I'm not sure who he stole it from because it's probably been stolen from lots of people. But cross-examination is not examination crossly. It doesn't need to be aggressive. And the best cross-examinations often can be friendly, can be professional, can be collegial. The, again, going back to the films and the TV shows, shouting at people, you know, slamming the table with your hand is often not the way to be effective in cross-examination, even going beyond you know, the possibility that the, the arbitrators may be from a background where that's not entertaining, but offensive. Um, you don't have to be obnoxious to be good at cross-examination. You can do it within your own personality. 
And in, in fact, if you put on a fake persona to do a cross-examination, you're probably not going to be very good at it. You should do it um, within your own personality. You can be yourself. And if yourself is friendly, if yourself is, you know, charming, if your self is forensic, you can do it any way you are. And the more authentic you are, the probably the more effective you'll be. But you also can't hide behind I, you know, you're by saying I'm that's myself to not be effective. And effective often means being persistent. I think this is one of the the, the most important things about cross-examination. Witnesses often out of nervousness, out of misunderstanding, but even more out of you know trying to avoid being cooperative, don't answer questions or don't answer questions um completely. And in real life, you wouldn't ask a person. A question four times, but in our, you know, in an arbitration or in the litigation, you may need to be persistent. You may have to keep saying you haven't answered my question or you haven't answered my question clearly. That's not being obnoxious. That's not being cross. Um, and you can do that in a very professional way. Um, you don't have to. You don't have to shout at them, but you're not answering my question. Um, there's times where you may want to make a show of losing your cool to keep them under control or to, you know, to hope the tribunal sees that the witness is not behaving properly. But generally, you can be persistent and thorough without necessarily being a jerk about it. Um, and so let me end cross-examination with a, a couple of tips on, on how we do this. Um, and again, it, it will change within each, you know, good cross-examiners will change their approach, their manner within a cross-examination. And they may fish around, they may start friendly, and then when they get, and then they may ask a lot of friendly questions and have be having a conversation. And then when they get to a critical point where they really want to show the witness now is, is being misleading, they may shift to a more critical tone or more, they may pick up their pace. And as I said earlier, you might have rhythm and pace in, in, in a way to sort of control the witness. But basic tips is tips, and these, these are true whether we're doing this online or whether we're doing this in person, is we, we want to maintain eye contact with witnesses. Um, we may, when we're doing cross-examination, also want to look occasionally at the tribunal because the cross-examiner is the center of a cross-examination. The witness is there for, is along for the ride. But when you're when you're asking the questions, you generally need to be looking and making eye contact with the witness. And you may want to establish some form of relationship or rapport with the witness. And the, the lawyer is putting that witness on will probably have told them, don't let the cross-examiner do that to you. And you may do that by being inquisitive, curious. You may do that by being friendly. You may do that by being chatty. Um, you may by, do that by being stern, but you, you usually try to establish some sort of rapport. And you may have to fish around a little bit to figure out what it's going to be with that witness. You generally don't want to be overly confrontational. And that's that point about not having to be cross. You always want to stay professional, which doesn't mean that you don't sometimes occasionally might be justified in slamming the table or raising your voice a little bit. But that, that really needs to be done for effect. And if you've actually lost your patience, or lost your cool, you're 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 losing the audience, and you're losing, and, you're, and the witness is taking control. And that, and and in order to sort of bear that in mind, it's important that you remember that in the end, the audience is not your client, who might love the fact that you're shouting at the witness. It's the tribunal who has to understand the significance and the substance of what you're trying to get. They may think it was really entertaining to watch the lawyer shout at the witness for an hour. But they also will go back to think to take that view that that was great, that was lovely, that was entertaining, but we're going to decide this case based on the documents because that cross-examination was useless. Um, and one last thing, and I, and I think this is part of understanding the, the way this works, is I said earlier how hard it is because you've got all these things you're doing at once. You're listening, you're thinking your next question, you're trying to gauge reactions, you're trying to plan ahead, you're thinking, why am I asking this question? What's the question going to be? Often that takes time. And if you maintain eye contact with the witness, what you may get is the witness filling that silence. Um, the witness, the witness almost always will think you know more at this point than they do. And if you stop and you may be thinking, oh no, where do I go now? If you look like you're in control, and if you if you physically are looking at the witness, the witness might start talking because because people have this. Um, this urge to fill silences, and they may think, hmm, she's not asking the next question. My answer must not have been satisfactory. And this is talking. And the amount of times you get really interesting testimony that comes out of accidental silences, sometimes intentional silences, is really interesting. So this is just the general idea of, of how you present yourself 
during cross-examination. Um, I'm going to do two seconds on re-examination, and then I'll stop. Um, re-examination is then you've finished your cross-examination. The lawyer who put the witness on is allowed to ask some follow-up questions. It's the hardest thing to do in litigation in, and in arbitration because um, you can only ask re-examination questions that have to do with the questions that were asked in cross-examination. They can't be leading questions, and you may be asking your re-examination questions hours after, after hours of cross-examination, and you have to ask that you're what, where, why, open questions. Um, and you're not meant to just be some repeat, having the witness repeat things they've already said. So you're, you're re-examining re only when there was a really damaging point that came out in cross-examination that you think you can fix, or that the witness didn't get the chance to fully explain something, muddled something up that you know if you could take them back to, they'll, they'll fix. So you're trying to rehabilitate a case theme or fix uh, uh, the witness's credibility. So you only do it when it's really important and it's really hard to do. It's really hard to do because you have to do it in open questions. And so the way people tend to do it um, is to try to, to sort of make a little speech to bring the witness to where to the, what the point is and then ask an open question. So Mr. X, you remember when the lawyer for the other side was asking you these questions about the, the minutes of the finance committee meeting in February, and he asked you about this and he asked you about that. Can you explain what, what was happening at that meeting? So you, you help the witness and you hopefully have signaled to them what the significance of all this is, but then you've asked an open question, but it's really difficult to do. And I'll stop there. I'm gonna turn the slides off. There's a little bit on quirkier stuff like hot tubbing that you guys can look at if you want, but. Um, I'm going to stop. I've gone up until um, the hour, so I haven't left a lot of time for questions, but I'm happy to stay for a bit and answer questions if anyone has them. Thank you very much, Stephen. I uh, I see also a couple of practitioners on the call as well, practicing lawyers, and I, I think certainly from my perspective, it's really an amazing refresher. Um, it's triggering a lot of memories, some good and bad from uh, being on the questioner side. Um, and in those preparation stages, of course. Are there any questions? And while I wait for hands to go up or people to come off mute, perhaps I can just demonstrate by example. Um, I mean, of course, there's a lot of things that are relevant to practice. And as I said at the beginning of the session, witness examination is not something that is, is ex exercised during the first mood specifically. There are cross-examination moods available, by the way, if anybody's interested. So were you going to say something? Well, I was going to say, yeah, I, I, what I that, that's a really good point. We're starting to see cross-examination boots, and they're really fun. And I encourage people to look out for opportunities to do mock cross-examinations. I think one of the biggest barriers that many lawyers have, particularly from civil jurisdictions, is the idea that they don't know how to do this. It's not part of their system. They can't catch up. And I would say this, you know, in international arbitration, some of the very, very best cross-examiners come from civil law jurisdictions because hopefully what came through there is it's about knowing the facts and it's about as, it's having a question plan. That's got nothing to do with being trained in a certain jurisdiction. It does take, it is scary and it takes practice, but most common lawyers who do international arbitration don't have a lot of practice at this. They, English solicitors aren't trained to do this at all. Um, American lawyers who are seen as the ones who do it, most of it usually have had one trial advocacy class where they've done a few mock mock examinations um, in their last term of, of law school. So if you start doing cross-examination moots or a lot of the different training opportunities that are out there to do mock examinations, you can catch up with the people um, who you think are ahead of you really quickly. And it's, it is, um, it is a, it's about facts. It's not about, it's not about legal background. Yeah, precisely. And on the going back just briefly to the point that you had mentioned about, you know, needing to interrogate when witnesses are talking about things that they don't really know about or what, you know, referring to the absence of information that's in a witness statement. I can maybe refer all the, the Mooties to the record. I'll leave it to them to judge how good my record site is. But um, specifically in Exhibit 3, which is page 14 of our dear record, um, that's the witness statement of William Kramer. Um, he says at paragraph 8, 
he's talking about a meeting in which he was involved with a Miss Queen, and he is describing that Miss Queen was not really interested in any amicable situation, but instead accused us of um, bribing government officials, etc. And then he goes on to say, in her view, Mr. Blanchley has deceived the respondent CEO, etc. Now, in that case, of course, we, we're not really permitted to talk about the mood problem, but I invite the, the students to, to think about, you know, what is the consequence of that? He's a, a person, he's a witness with a signed testimony, which you are told to treat as fact, but he's talking about the view of another person who was in a meeting, and she has not submitted a witness statement herself. Um, and it doesn't appear that there's even, uh, well, that's a question I leave for you to determine, but is there sufficient <laughs> sufficient evidence in the record which supports the, you know, which is a record of this meeting itself, which recorded what people actually thought or said or did. And then going, I refer you further to paragraph 11, just as another example, is he has also said um, in the middle of the paragraph, we have not found any indication that Mr. Blanchley has breached the um, ethical rules of the company. Um, you know, and unfortunately, he is not willing to testify. So there, there are potentially two problems with that is he's he's saying he's creating an inference that this person has committed certain breaches, but then has admitted that they don't have evidence. Mm -hmm. um, so just I, I would encourage you. I mean, I, I won't repeat too much of it. I know my my poor team has heard me <laughs> um, sort of criticizing witness statements many times in the past, and they might think I'm a bit nuts. But um, just as you go through, think about how you can get more from these witness statements in the mood problem to support or enhance some of your existing arguments as you prefer for mm -hmm. the, you prepare for the remaining pre moods and and the first moods itself. And let me, I think that's a great way to to come back to the mood. And let me tell you my mood advice as someone who's been an arbitrator for many years and have have just I've just judged the finals of two pre moods on this problem. The teams that do best are ones that aren't afraid of the facts and aren't afraid to weave the facts into their arguments and to make critical comments about the facts. Um, the facts are there to, to be used. And so many teams just want to make legal points um, and don't wrestle with them. It is as a to listen and to persuade someone talking about a, a coherent story, as I said at the beginning, is so much more effective. So don't be afraid of the facts. Erin's given you, she's pointed you to places in the witness statement that you may um, either need to bolster if you're on one side of the case or, or criticize if you're on the other. But um, it's, um, I, it really, to do to do well at the moot, but generally the art of advocacy is the art of telling a compelling story. And, I, and again, I use the word story with no pejorative sense. Um, in an arbitration, we can't recreate what happened um, and everything that happened happened different people will have seen differently but we have to tell the story based on the record we have and 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 that story has to be compelling and it, and if we can tell it well we win and we so we can't be afraid to tell it it's a lot easier to make a decision as an arbitrator if you have a feeling that you know what happened um, than it is to be answering dry legal questions and trying to figure out whether you're answering them correctly Exactly. And just a reminder, I mean, we we had mentioned this with all the students, uh, well, in previous sessions, but also in the recent pre moot, is that the, the mood problem is designed to be balanced. It's designed so that there's no such thing as one clear winner. Oh, my, I should have mentioned at the beginning of the call that we are joined by a sort of feline African the mood participant. Um, but it's designed to be balanced. So there is something that can be argued for both parties. Um, and that, of course, means that there are weak points and strong points for both parties. And even if the, the points appear weaker, I think I, I've heard some rumblings of people being a bit reluctant to argue for a respondent, for example. But uh, you absolutely can find power and empower yourself with your persuasion and how you deal with those facts and present them to the tribunal. So if folks have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, I will thank you all for listening and wish hey. you all... Um, Hello. Yeah, hi. Veronica, hi. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for uh, the insightful presentation, Stephen. And uh, the tips are very relevant for both um, arbitration proceedings and litigation. And I cannot agree any better with uh, Aaron when he said that you are a very resourceful person to connect with. And uh, <laughs> I look forward to connecting with you. This is Veronica Dosa. Veronica, and, it's nice to meet you. And, and like I said, I'm happy to keep talking if you want to send me an email or 
um, reach out on LinkedIn or anything. I, I, I love talking about this stuff. So, uh, and if you're going to go to uh, the moot, I will be there for a couple of days as well. Absolutely. I'm going to send you an email right away. So um, I have been wondering, I mean, throughout your presentation, um, I mean, there's a lot to chew on right now, I can tell. And um, I was wondering why the witness testimony is being critiqued as one of, uh, I mean, a worse form of testimony, mm -hmm. considering the virtual um, arbitration proceedings that we have currently, and then the um, issue of uh, exchanging documents via the internet during arbitration proceedings. And I'm also wondering the implication of this critique on um, procedural fairness during international um, arbitration. And then as you, um, I listened to you, you said um, the arbitration proceedings usually has been operating in um, not so much of rules. So uh, is there, a rule of uh, that governs confidentiality issues when mm. there comes to transfer mm. of um, um, document and um, um, so <laughs> let, let me answer that question. And when I say there's no rules, I don't you know there are rules, but they don't we don't have detailed rules that tell us how to handle lots of the things that that we would have rules for in a litigation. So we have we don't have an evidentiary code. We don't have. Um, a very prescriptive set that we we have this deadline automatically for and, and these sorts of submissions. In each case, the parties have to work that out. And that's one of the benefits of arbitration is, is that the, we customize it to meet the needs of the particular case. In terms of confidentiality, it's a really interesting question. So where do we get confidentiality from? Well, we may get some confidentiality rules from the law of the place of arbitration. Um, some jurisdictions, for example, will presume that arbitrations are confidential. Most are silent. Um, and people often make this, the mistake of thinking arbitration is, is automatically confidential. And there's very few jurisdictions where it's clear in the law that just because you're doing an arbitration, it's automatically confidential. And so we have to fix that if we know what we're doing by making sure we govern confidentiality in the contract um, or the arbitration agreement. So that many contracts, but not all, will have a confidentiality provision. Some of them are written in ways, many times they're written in ways that don't anticipate that there'll be a dispute, and therefore there are gaps. And then sometimes what we have is the parties think about that and go, oh, we now have an arbitration. Maybe we want to agree um, that we'll keep things confidential, um, but not always. And so whether there is co a confidentiality obligation and what it covers is often an open question. The best way to do it is to reach agreement. That's where you get the clearest um, answer. But if you don't, there can be gaps or there may not be confidentiality. Um, and so when you're talking about then transferring documents within the arbitration, uh, there may at that point, even if there isn't an overarching confidentiality rule, the depending on who you're talking about the transfer to, the arbitration rules might at least impose a duty of obligation on the arbitrators and the arbitration institution. Um, and in a procedural order, the parties may have agreed or the tribunal may have opposed some process for transferring documents that, that are meant to keep them confidential. But it's a real open question. And um, it's not as confidential as people think it is unless they actually um, clearly make it confidential by agreement. Yeah, so um, I mean, confidentiality reference to, I mean, safety of documents, transferring it, I mean, over... Uh... So, so a hot issue that doesn't get as much attention as it should is, is exactly this, is cybersecurity as well. Um, and yeah. it's it's not, not enough attention is paid to it because it's scary and complicated. Um, there is a, um, a very significant, um, I'm trying to think what to call it, guidelines or protocol that was published a couple of years ago. And again, this stuff all gets lost because I think this was in um, fall, 2019 um, by ICA, which is one of the big um, arbitration or you know, voluntary organizations that everyone can join if you want to pay the membership fee. Um, um, the New York Bar Association, and I'm forgetting somebody else, another um, organization on issues of, of data protection and cybersecurity and how to deal with those things in international arbitration and flagging all the risks ranging from you, know, you sitting in a hotel lobby 
using the open network to get online and having someone pluck your confidential arbitration documents um, out or you having an 80 year old arbitrator who doesn't know how to, to make sure that the connection is secure, uh, all those sorts of issues. No, there's cybersecurity, um, both hacking within um, the arbitration in the sense of one side hacking the other side, but more also outsiders um, trying to get information um, is obviously enhanced when we do stuff online and we're more and more rather than doing stuff in hard copy, sharing stuff online. And that's a huge area that people are starting to wrestle with, but are scared of. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Because I was just also imagining the virtual experiences that um, lawyers go through. Mm -hmm. uh, issue of getting familiar, I mean, familiar with um, technology when you are representing your clients over and how, you know, you might um, mistakenly share your screen of some documents that you, I mean. <laughs> yeah, so what we, what we do when we do, when we do fully online proceed, uh, proceedings now, lots of people are starting to use vendors who have closed systems and create some comfort. We also have, uh, and some of the arbitration institutions will, when they organize online hearings, will have, will they, they've gotten, they've learned really quickly in the last couple of years to um, to um, try to manage the security. But yeah, it is a risk. Um, I'm quickly looking, if I can do it fast enough, I will put um, the link to this protocol in the, um, into the chat. If you're interested in the cybersecurity issues, the starting point really is this. Um, um, you can also um, send it to me and I can drop it into the, the WhatsApp group and send it. To I you. just put the link, although it came as a massive link. So it's the New York Bar ICA, which is frankly, I never remember what's called the International Congress of Commercial Arbitrators or something like that, which mostly focuses on these days on treaty arbitration, despite the commercial in the name and CPR, which is a US based um, dispute resolution, arbitration, um, ad hoc, you know, they, they have rules for ad hoc arbitration. So they have this, 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 uh, cybersecurity protocol, um, which is really scary, <laughs> but, but important. Like, if Ronica, you've got, you raised about 16 really interesting questions. Um, and it would take a long time to work through all of them, but I think, yeah, I think you, you put your finger on, you know, future, future issues as we, as we are wrestling with technology, which has got huge positives, but also adds risks. Absolutely, yes. So I think essentially, like you had rightly pointed out, my question is really on the IT technology and how um, it could um, affect the confidence of the, the lawyer when they are doing uh, presentation. Sure, well, sure. Look, let me, let me take it back to cross-examination for a second. I'm actually, what we had, you know, be a bit of a, a sociologist here is when when the pandemic started, we suddenly had lots of people embrace online cross examination and say, "Look, this is brilliant, and let's go forward and have all these online hearings." And everyone told you how great it was to do online hearings um, and how they were effectively cross examining people um, during uh, using uh, you know online cross examinations. And then as we've started to come out of the the, the, the really lockdown phases, suddenly everyone is done a complete reversal and said, oh, it was terrible. Um, I really want to be back cross-examining witnesses in person because I want to look into the eyes of the witness and tell whether she's telling the truth. And I can't really read her body language um, unless I'm in the room with her. And, and that's so critical and that sort of physicality and the ability to also you know, make eyes at the tribunal um, is so important and that can't be done unless you're in the room with them. And so um, online arbitration is, is, is sort of a much less effective version. I think that's all um, ridiculous. On online arbitration, online cross-examinations are different, but they're not necessarily worse. And in fact, I certainly have not had any problem um, doing the most difficult, aggressive, in the sense of going after someone for lying, cross-examinations online. And when someone's lying and really lying, it's, ju it's just as visible and maybe even more visible online because their face is covering the whole screen rather than them sitting you know, 20 feet away, you know, four meters away from, from the tribunal. So it's different and you got to do things differently. Your rhythm is different. You have to be less, you know, you, 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 you say things differently. You can't go as long, but different doesn't mean better or worse. And there are things that are 
easier to do online and there are things that are worse to do online and it's not going to go away. We're, we're going to increasingly see, even in hearings that are mostly together in person, we will increasingly make accommodations for the witness who can't fly to Singapore or can't fly to, to Lagos um, or is um, we ran out of time and we want to have the experts come back um, later and we're going to schedule a day where we're going to have the experts cross-examined by, by video. And so we all have to learn to live with it. Um, and and find the, the best of it. And that's different from your security risk issues, but um, online hearings are here to stay and they have some real cost benefits. They also have some real flexibility benefits. One of the reasons I walked through that whole idea of how we structure things is, you know, if the whole case is built around getting everybody together from all over the world for one final big hearing, um, and they're gonna be physically in one place, we do everything at once. We have this comprehensive hearing. But if we have the ability to get people online, we can start to carve out issues. And maybe we have um, an argument about why there's a statute of limitations problem dealt with you know, three months into the case um, in an online hearing where one arbitrator is sitting in, in Pretoria, one arbitrator is sitting in Mauritius, and one arbitrator is sitting in Geneva, and they don't have to all fly um, to, to um, London or wherever. And, and so, we're going to start to try to take advantage of the technology and then we have to learn how to deal with the risks as well. Thank you so much, uh, Stephen. I think because of the time and also just conscious of how some of our participants are in different time zones, which are yeah. much, late, much later than where you and I are, I think we can we can end it here and I encourage everybody to, um, well, I'm just doing this on your behalf, Stephen, <laughs> to, just to encourage everybody to reach out to you and make contact and ask questions. Um, and then also we will we will be posting this uh, video, we'll circulate it on the group. And also if you can share your slides, that will be great. And I will circulate those as well. But Good. thank you so much for your time and your your patience and your passion, which is very, very evident in how you present. And we're so grateful to, to spend the time with you and to have you share your expertise. Um, and we are grateful also that you, you are such a good friend of Africa in the moot, of course. We'll see you online, as you seem to be heavily advocating for, to <laughs> your, your pro-cyber position, but also in person um, in various jurisdictions in this year. Thanks, Aaron. And thanks, thanks everyone. And I hope you're enjoying it and continue. Good luck for those of you who are still moody. Um, and um, maybe I'll see some of you in person soon or online. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Bye.